banned in Parliament are now threatened to be banned in the US. TikTok fights for survival in the West. The Chinese social media company's CEO faced a hostile grilling in Congress over fears that people's data was at risk from the authorities in Beijing. Yes or no, do they have access to user data? We have, after Project Texas is done, the answer is no. Also in news at 10 tonight, a fire officer accused of rape but promoted just days later. A horrifying report from Tynan Weir in Paul's continuing investigation of fire services across Britain. And... The police and protesters have clashed. There have been pyrotechnics. More than a million on the streets as violent clashes continue in France over President Macron's state pension reforms. More pain for mortgage payers as the Bank of England hikes interest rates for the 11th consecutive time. And... And there is his immortal moment. Goal number 54 makes Harry Kane England's all-time record goal scorer. This is ITV News at 10 with Raggy Omar. Good evening. There has been a trend in recent years for Western democracies to look at the rapid rise of Chinese technology in our everyday lives with increasing suspicion. From worries about the Huawei telecoms giant integrating itself into our 5G network to deep concerns about how our data is used on the TikTok video sharing app. TikTok is the first truly global social media platform to be invented and controlled outside of Silicon Valley and is used by many Western politicians and security officials. Today, though, it was blocked across the UK parliamentary network and on Scottish government devices. And in the United States, where it has 150 million users, a total shutdown is being threatened. So to try to allay the growing national security concerns over the company's links to Beijing, its chief executive came to Congress today. He insisted TikTok was committed to being kept free of government interference, but he had a hard time convincing the committee. I got my head out this sunroof. I'm blasting my favorite tunes. It is the go-to app for many teenagers around the world to post videos and share content. Hi everyone, it's Sho here. But this week, TikTok CEO put up his own message outlining the threat to the company amid concerns it's being used by the Chinese government as a surveillance tool. Some politicians have started talking about banning TikTok. Was it developed in China? It's a global collaborative effort. Like a lot of companies. Was it developed in China? Sho Chu spent almost four hours facing a barrage of questions from US politicians. Yes or no? Is it or is it not a Chinese company? I'd like answers, yes or no. Many centered on TikTok's Chinese parent company, ByteDance, and to what extent it was able to mine the data of TikTok users. Congressman, I would appreciate this. This is a complex topic. Today, all data yes, is stored yes by no. default. It's not that complex. Yes or no, do they have access to user data? We have, after Project Texas is done, the answer is no. So and right now, until new US, US safeguards yeah, are put in, the answer yeah, seems to be yes. yes. And then there was a visceral demonstration yes no. of the harmful content that can appear on TikTok, including videos about suicides. Right your technology is literally leading to death. A point rammed home when it was pointed out a threat to the committee's chairwoman was still online and had been on TikTok for weeks. And you expect us to believe that you are capable of maintaining the data security, privacy and security of 150 million Americans where you can't even protect the people in this room? Mr. Chu was also challenged about the censorship of videos which might be embarrassing to China. Have any moderation tools been used to remove content on TikTok associated with the Uyghur genocide? Yes or no? We do not remove uh, that kind of content. But Uyghur activist Baba Ilchi disagrees. His grandfather died after being detained in what he says was a Chinese prison camp. He thinks TikTok has repeatedly suppressed videos about the plight of Uyghurs. And even to this day, they are unable to admit that this is something that is happening or that it's important and 
continually dance around it, saying that they can't take a stance. And I think that that is concerning and shows that there is probably some level of relationship between the Chinese government and TikTok executives that uh, should be exposed and should be brought into the light. Sho Chu, who is Singaporean, insists TikTok is not controlled by the Chinese and says it is listening. Our approach has never been to dismiss or trivialize any of these concerns. We have addressed them with real action. But today, as the committee concluded, it felt like TikTok was under pressure like never before. Without objection, the committee is adjourned. As countries around the world consider the risk it might pose. And Dan is in Washington. Dan, it was a brutal uh, grilling by the CEO of uh, TikTok. And it's hard to escape the feeling that around the world, as you said in your report, governments are really taking a long, hard look uh, about the future of TikTok. Yeah, it feels like the momentum's going on only one way, Raggy. Uh, here in the US, federal staff have been told uh, to delete uh, TikTok. A similar instruction has been given to government staff uh, in Canada, in Taiwan, in Norway, in the EU. India has banned the app uh, countrywide completely. Uh, and now today we've heard in the UK that parliamentary staff are also being told to delete it. And that's after ministers and civil servants in Britain have, have been told the same. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of moves uh, all around the world. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith, uh, a prominent critic of China, uh, says this all shows uh, just how much the, the capabilities of this app really should concern everybody. It is also a data harvester, and lots of that data can get used uh, by the state, and they call upon uh, TikTok to do so, either directly or through other companies. So here's the key point that Westminster has finally realised, the government has finally realised, that this poses a genuine threat if they're able to take data from individuals, use their app as a tracker. Well, uh, across uh, Washington, there seems to be a rare moment of unanimity here. It's an issue which has united both uh, Republicans and Democrats. But look, TikTok is pointing out it's got a headquarters in L.A. and Singapore. Uh, it's got three Americans on its board and is insisting it's got this huge project, Project Texas, which it says will safeguard uh, U.S. user data. But there's a lot of scepticism here about that. OK, Dan in Washington, thank you. Now, we have already exposed several truly shocking cases of sexual harassment within some of the country's fire services. But tonight, how a serving firefighter who'd been accused of rape was promoted while under investigation. His colleagues at Tyne and Weir contacted us in disgust. They say he should have been suspended. And we heard yet more distressing details about the culture from another former firefighter there. She described it as a sickening nightmare. I thought I was safe with these kind of people, especially someone that saves lives. This is the testimony of a woman who says she wasn't saved, but assaulted by a firefighter. An event organized by his service on Tyneside led to another at the hotel where she was staying that would ruin her life, following a night of drinking in the bar. I remember getting into the elevator to go up to my room and he was in the elevator. Then it turned out I was in his room and I fell asleep. I woke up and he was pulling me hair really, really hard, aggressively, and he was nearly hitting me. I started crying. My belly button ring was missing. He must have taken it out. She feared that he'd raped her while she was sleeping. I went over to pick up his phone and ring my sister and he took the phone out of my hand and said, you're not using my phone. He stood over me and I pushed him away from me and I got out of the room and I didn't know what to do. Later, when I used the bathroom, there was blood. I didn't know where it came from. Northumbria police were called and spent three months investigating, but their sister service wasn't waiting for an outcome. Tyne and Weir Fire and Rescue promoted the man to management days after the alleged rape to the disgust of other firefighters we've spoken to whose identity we're protecting. It wasn't just me. Everybody couldn't understand how somebody could be promoted when he's actually under investigation for rape. I think he should have been suspended on the spot. Eventually, police closed the case without charges, but there are other allegations. How would you sum up your experience in the fire service? A sickening nightmare, to be fair. 
This woman says she was sexually harassed and bullied for years. I had my breasts groped. Uh, I had my vagina groped. Why do they think they can get away with doing that? Well, because we're too afraid to complain. I had a, a screw removed from my own personal breathing apparatus mask. So the mask that you wear to go into a fire? Yes. Was tampered with? Yes. And I could have potentially collapsed and died in a fire. When we asked Tyne and Weir Fire Service to respond to all the allegations, the shutters remained firmly down. We've asked you for a fill in interview to climb back. After his office repeatedly told us he would not do an interview, we had to find the fire chief at his gym, where he said he'd just been on holiday. I'm only able to speak about at this time. If you'd like to arrange a full interview, it work. I'm happy to do that. Thanks, have a seat. Have a seat. So we did, a few hours later. Chief Fire Officer, why did I have to track you down at your gym today in order to get you to answer these questions? All I can say is I'm more than happy to be sat here speaking to you now. Can you just explain to me why somebody being investigated by the police for an alleged rape would end up being promoted within your service? So, we checked the timelines and all the promotion processes were fully complete before the allegations were made and before the event took place where the allegations were made from. The person was confirmed promoted after that. Um, as Chief Fire Officer, I don't get involved with promotions at that level. Hang on a minute, you knew about the alleged rape, correct? Yes. You knew about the promotion, correct? Yes. That wasn't a moral dilemma for you at any point? You didn't think, this doesn't feel right in my gut? There's, there's many things over my time as Chief which don't feel right. Sometimes I've got to make difficult decisions. Did I've... that feel right? That, that I can't remember how exactly I felt at the time, but what I will tell you is You know that... it wasn't right. Chris, you know it wasn't right. We always keep our procedures under review and we are going to review the procedures which led to this decision. But the fire service as a whole continues to defend its culture tonight, despite all the warnings. Paul Brand, News at 10, Tyneside. To France now, where the sheer support for some of the country's biggest strikes in years is emboldening unions to call for yet more action next week. This evening, dramatic scenes in Bordeaux, where the town hall has been set on fire as demonstrations turn violent on the ninth day of protests across the country. Let's have a look at the situation that has unfolded. More than a million people are estimated to have taken part in today's demonstrations at more than 250 protests across the country. Polls show widespread opposition to a rise in the state pension age from 62 to 64, which is around the EU average. So why has President Macron forced this through Parliament without so much as a vote? The answer, the spiralling cost of French pensions, already 330 billion euros a year. There is a devotion to demonstration in France and a history that shows the street can be the best avenue to win or block change. Today, more than a million people marched and shouted across the country in their fight against pension reforms. President Macron has used his executive power to enforce the law, forcing them to retire later at 64, not 62. I want to live uh, another life than just work and die. That's it. It's a human right. We have to have the, the chance to, to enjoy our retirement. It's a true, like, I think it's a human right. And we all have to fight for it because, like, the government doesn't understand and is kind of disconnected to the reality, actually. We, we have to, to, to make Macron see that people are not, uh, are not resigned. They want to, they want to fight his, uh, his law and they want him to listen to the people. Their banners spoke of rage. And then we saw it. Angry, masked men charged at police. This was a mob bent on destruction, a faction of the march with a different agenda. Retirement was not their cause, trouble was. It put a force on the defence, but at times they cowered. They looked outnumbered, yet 12,000 extra were deployed nationwide. Innocents fell victim to the chaos, and police too. There was no predicting where the missiles would fall. This protest started about an hour ago and was relatively peaceful. Within a matter of minutes in this area, the police and protesters have clashed. There have been pyrotechnics. And protesters are throwing fireworks. They have been trying to bash through windows. This is turning to a situation of serious social unrest. 
arrests were made. But then violence would surge again. It was a bloody afternoon. Tonight, Paris burns with discontent and anger, with no sign of a resolution. The protests may dissipate, but the bitterness hangs on. Lucy Watson, News at 10, Paris. Borrowers who'd hoped for a month's reprieve from the relentless rise of interest rates were left disappointed this afternoon. The Bank of England announced the 11th consecutive increase, with the rate now standing at 4.25%. There was speculation that recent volatility in the financial markets could prompt a pause in rate hikes. But then came yesterday's inflation figures, a nasty surprise economists had not been banking on. Outside the Bank of England, there are signs the weather is changing. But living standards in Britain are currently caught in bleak midwinter, and another interest rate rise will leave a lot of people feeling poorer. Jenny Holden's fixed rate mortgage deal expires in May. Her monthly repayments are now set to increase by at least £300. She and her husband have already sold one of their cars and have cancelled plans for a foreign holiday this year. The house is, is everything. We don't want to lose the house, so we'll do everything in our power. You know, if it means getting rid of the other car, we will. But, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll make do. We have to. In the space of 15 months, bank rate has risen from 0.1% to 4.25%. The market expectation is interest rates may have almost peaked, although investors are betting that another rise is likely in August. Since November 2021, the average mortgage repayment has risen by £350 a month. The headline rate of inflation stands at 10.4%, five times the Bank of England's target rate. But the governor points out that energy prices have fallen and the outlook is better. Back at the beginning of February, you know, we were really a bit on a knife edge as to whether there would be a recession. Certainly we thought the economy would be quite stagnant. I'm not saying it's going to, it's not off to the races, let's be clear, but I'm a bit more optimistic now on that front. In the last two weeks, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the bailout of Credit Suisse have shown that higher interest rates can cause big problems for banks as well as their customers. But the Bank of England is undeterred. The Bank of England's decision is based on an assumption that the UK banking system is in pretty good health. Robust and resilient is the verdict in the minutes of the meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee. But the minutes also concede that it's too soon to know if banks will be more cautious about the way they lend in future. The Bank of England's concern remains that companies are raising pay and their prices in a way that feeds inflation. At this restaurant in Essex, hourly pay has gone up by up to 25% in some cases. We have had to uh, because, unfortunately, this sector is really suffering with um, recruitment and retention. And we've tried very hard to find uh, good staff uh, and we've had to offer something much better. The evidence suggests that wage growth nationally is actually weakening. As always, the future is unknowable, but the bank believes the outlook has become even more uncertain. Raising interest rates is seen as playing it safe. Joel Hills, News at 10. A wealthy Nigerian couple are tonight facing jail after trafficking a young Lagos street seller to the UK in order to harvest his kidney. Ike Ekweramadu and his wife Beatrice were found guilty of a modern slavery offence. They had arranged the transplant for their daughter, who has a serious kidney condition, promising the would-be donor up to £7,000. Detectives said it is the first conviction of its kind. On Monday, a hearing is due to begin in a major legal battle brought by Prince Harry and Baroness Doreen Lawrence, along with other high-profile figures. They accuse the publisher of the Daily Mail and Mail on Sunday of bugging phones and bl blagging private information, something it vehemently denies. But tonight, we've heard from one private investigator jailed for phone hacking at the News of the World who claims that wasn't the only paper which paid for his services. Is there anything you'd like to say to the victims of your hacking, Mr Marquette? His name is synonymous with phone hacking at the News of the World. 
Private investigator Glenn Mulcair was jailed for his illegal tactics. But now, in an interview with ITV News, he claims the criminality spread further through Fleet Street. The public perception that my services were used only by News International is not the case. As my services and skills were used by other papers, such as the Mail on Sunday. The phone hacking scandal led to the closure of the News of the World, but... Phone hacking was not practiced by the Mail on Sunday or the Daily Mail. Associated newspapers have always insisted they never employed the so-called dark arts of their rivals. We had the transcripts and we have the end product, which is the hacked product, to the Mail on Sunday. But at his kitchen table, Glenn Mulcair shows me what he claims is a paper trail from 2006. He says he was tasked by a freelance journalist who then offered hacked information to Associated Newspapers. This is a Jude Laws transcript. Handwritten notes, voicemail transcripts, emails and a payment record, which he claims show his illegally obtained information was paid for by the Mail on Sunday. Shady, Shady. He says he hacked Sadie Frost and her friends and family, and the Lib Dem MP, Simon Hughes, both among a group now taking legal action against Associated Newspapers for alleged breaches of privacy. Associated Newspapers have always strenuously denied that any hacking took place at their newspapers. Paul Dacre uh, made that claim on oath at the Leveson Inquiry. What would you say to that? Well, I wouldn't offer an opinion. I'd just say follow the evidence. Some people would say, you've been convicted, you've been sent to prison, You've got an axe to grind. Why should we believe what you say now? Everyone's after justice. I'd rather be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Do you think there are other people in the industry that need to be held to account? Well, absolutely. Hacking started before me. It ha hacking was during me and hacking continued after me. Associated Newspapers told ITV News we have never instructed, commissioned or paid Glenn Mulcair to engage in hacking or unlawful information gathering for any Associated Newspaper titles, nor have we ever knowingly published articles as a result of his activities. When it emerged murdered schoolgirl Millie Dowler had been hacked by the News of the World, it led to public outrage and Glenn Mulcair's second conviction. I have four daughters myself, all I wanted to find was a missing girl. But he insists he was not the main culprit at the News of the World. They were hacking Millie Dowler's phone. The police knew they were hacking Millie Dowler's phone long before I was tasked. Oh, the venom, you know, being one of the most hated men in Britain, you know, it's, it's taking its toll you know, on me and my family. So I totally and absolutely understand the devastation it happens on other people and other victims. He now hopes to appeal and one day overturn his second conviction. And Rebecca joins me. Now, Rebecca, these are <laughs> serious allegations. What more are Associated Newspapers saying about this? Well, they've told us that 17 years ago, a freelance journalist did offer information to the Mail on Sunday, but that it emphatically was not made clear at the time that that came from Glenn Mulcair. They say the information wasn't used and the freelance journalist was paid a so-called kill fee. They also point out that these allegations come from a man... Uh, convicted and jailed for phone hacking. That's true. But next week, Associated Newspapers will be at the High Court facing other allegations of unlawful information gathering from the likes of Prince Harry and Baroness Doreen Lawrence. OK, well, we'll follow that closely. Thanks very much indeed. Dozens of families who lost loved ones to coronavirus have told ITV News they will boycott a key plank of the COVID inquiry because of the involvement of companies which profited from government contracts during the pandemic. A spokesperson for the inquiry said they are very sorry that some people may choose not to come forward, but the door is always open. ITV News understands that former Prime Minister David Cameron and former Chancellor George Osborne have been approached to give evidence which is likely to look at the impact austerity had on the health service. For nearly a decade, she has dominated Scottish politics, but there was to be no gentle send-off for Nicola Sturgeon as she took her final session of First Minister's questions today. For almost 90 minutes at a distinctly fractious Holyrood, the outgoing leader faced pressure on both her record in government and on the turmoil engulfing the SNP as she stands down. For the 286th and final time, 
Nicola Sturgeon today walked the long corridor of Holyrood to face First Minister's questions. But there was no ceremonial farewell awaiting her. They lied to the press and they lied to the public. With the SNP in turmoil, her party is now accused of giving out misleading membership numbers. We do not use the word lie in this chamber. This turned out to be among the most bitter sessions she has ever faced. I don't think Conservatives, yeah, given yesterday's it's events it's in the House of Commons, should be lecturing anyone about honesty and integrity. Labour then asked about all her records in office. Record drug deaths, record vacancies for nurses and doctors in our NHS, record levels of children without a home. But while Labour still prefers to see this country governed by Tories at Westminster, Labour will never ever be taken seriously in Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon has seen off four Prime Ministers and won eight elections in eight years as leader. But what she really wanted was another independence referendum. And if the UK government says no? The UK government won't keep saying no. But the UK government did keep saying no. Nicola Sturgeon ran out of road and energy. Today she ended on a moment of personal reflection. To the people of Scotland, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart for the privilege of being your First Minister. This is not how Nicola Sturgeon dreamed it would end. She has not steered Scotland to independence, but that responsibility will now fall on whoever wins the race to succeed her on Monday. No tears quite, but do you leave with any regrets? Oh look, you know, show me a human being or a politician or a, a government minister uh, that doesn't have regrets and I show you somebody that's not properly human. What's your <laughs> biggest one? Uh, look, I'm not going to do that today. No uh, independence? There, uh, I would love to have been the leader who took Scotland to independence, but for me, attaining independence is much, 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 much more important than the person who leads us there. The saying goes, all political careers end in failure. Nicola Sturgeon's time at the top has ended, but it is only from this day that history will begin to judge her real lasting legacy on party and on country. Peter Smith, News at 10, Edinburgh. Finally, on the list of England's greatest goal scorers, there is a new man at the top. The records of Gary Lineker, Sir Bobby Charlton and Wayne Rooney have tonight all been surpassed with... Harry Kane finding the net for the 54th time. Kicking off the Three Lions Euro qualification, he helped secure a 2-1 win against reigning champions Italy. It earned him both royal approval from Prince William and a friendly word from the man whose record he surpassed. They have to keep... This was England's first match since their World Cup quarter-final defeat against a team they last faced in the final of the Euros. Plenty then to put right, and England wasted little time doing it. Declan Rice giving them the lead inside the first 13 minutes. But this was the moment the three Lions were waiting for after the nightmare of that missed penalty in Qatar. This goal bringing not just redemption for Harry Kane, but a place in the record books. His immortal moment. Harry Kane's 54th goal for England as England's all-time leading goalscorer. All -time Just look how much it meant to the fans, the captain and his teammates. He's beaten Wayne Rooney's record. His former teammate promptly tweeting his congratulations, writing great man, unbelievable goalscorer and an England legend. And a chance for a target. Italy pegged it back to 2-1 and piled on the pressure. But despite England being reduced to 10 men, they couldn't find the equaliser nor take the shine of Kane's night. Yeah, it means everything, you know. Uh, yeah, we're so excited to put the England shirt back on and get back out here and get the campaign started for the, uh, for the Euros next year. And uh, yeah, it had to be a penalty, of course. And uh... England laying strong foundations for their qualifying campaign, their captain cementing his reputation as one of the greats. Rachel Younger, News at 10. Record goal scorer for England, Harry Kane. And that is all from us tonight. I'll be back tomorrow night. Until then, from me and the rest of the team, thank you for watching and have a great night.